everybody. My name is uh, Michael Frett. I'm an aquatic biologist here at Aquafix. And uh, as an aquatic biologist here, uh, it's really my job to, to fundamentally research the science behind our products and treatment system solutions for all of you. And uh, I'd like today to share some information on nitrification as well as some, inf as some information about some of our solutions that we provide at Aquafix for recovering uh, uh, nitrification and optimizing nitrification within your specific uh, treatment system. And so I first would like to start this presentation with why we believe this webinar is going to be important and relevant to all of you. And so if you've joined us here today, I believe I can reasonably assume that each of you have an interest in ammonia removal in your uh, specific wastewater uh, treatment facility. And so one of our primary goals at Aquafix is to really help assist and be a partner with all of you and your wastewater treatment plants in order to achieve these two goals. And that's going to be efficient ammonia removal as well as efficient recovery from elevated um, effluent ammonia levels. And so that's what we're going to be discussing today, and that's why it's important. We want to be a partner to all of you to really achieve these two goals. And so during today's presentation, um, I just wanted to give a little rundown of what we're going to be covering. We're first going to uh, talk about um, nitrogen in general, and this is going to include the nitrogen cycle and nitrifying bacteria. Um, we're going to take a, a look at some of the environmental parameters that allow for nitrification and can also hinder nitrification. We're going to take a look at uh, one of Aquafix's primary nitrification products, Vitastim Dynamic Duo, and how that can be used and applied to help with your nitrification in your plant. And finally, we're going to take a look at some of our recent research and information, not only on just nitrification and ammonia uptake in general, but also the use of uh, our product here at Aquafix Vitasim Dynamic Duo in helping accelerate uh, and recover nitrification in your treatment plants. Most of the production, um, research, and analysis in regard to the development and testing of Aquafix's not only nitrification products, but also nitrification solutions and assistance is going to be done within our, our laboratories. And as I said, the Aquafix labs are located in the University Research Park in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, here in our labs, we've been able to really fundamentally grow our knowledge base on nitrification through research, and we've been able to refine our nitrification solutions with testing in our laboratories for all of you. And so really to begin today's presentation, um, I wanted to start with the nitrogen cycle in general, but also how it relates to wastewater systems. Um, and so if you're looking at this figure here, um, it can somewhat illustrate the many, many interactions and forms nitrogen can have throughout the environment. Although the complex interactions shown here are really not entirely relevant for today's presentation specifically on nitrification, it's important to understand that the nitrogen and ammonia that you reduce in your wastewater treatment facilities is going to be a part of this larger cycle and where nitrogen's going in the environment. And so when we regard, uh, when, when we're talking about wastewater sources of nitrogen specifically, um, we're going to see that the most commonly thought of input of nitrogen is the biological nitrogen from plants, animal waste, and soil runoff, primarily from agricultural sources. And uh, the industrial production of nitrogen as a byproduct can also act as an input to not only the environment, but subsequently wastewater treatment plants as well. Um, there's also going to be nitrate in groundwater, since nitrate, unlike Ammonia is not going to be bound to soil or clay particles, and it can move through the soil freely and into the groundwater. So, for example, if your plant has a lot of input from infiltration in an agricultural area, you may be dealing with high nitrate coming into your plant. And one last thing I wanted to say about nit the nitrogen cycle and wastewater in general is that the biological treatment in wastewater plants is going to be used to prevent most of this nitrogen as well as other compounds from ending up back into our environment and leading to undesirable outcomes such as these algal blooms that we see in lakes, fish deaths, and the prevalence of nitrate and nitrite in drinking water wells. 
So moving on, I want to talk a little bit more specifically about nitrogen and what we're seeing in wastewater. And nitrogen can be organized into two primary categories in wastewater. That's going to be organic nitrogen and inorganic nitrogen. Organic nitrogen is compromised um, of nitrogen molecules that are going to be bound to larger biological molecules that contain carbon as a part of their construction. Within a wastewater treatment plant, organic nitrogen is typically bound to a plant's influent BOD as a whole, um, and, that's, and, and that's really where you're going to find your organic nitrogen. Um, and then when we can transition into and move on to inorganic nitrogen, we can start with ammonia, which uh, really can be categorized as either the charged ion NH4 plus ammonium or just the uncharged NH3 ammonia. We also then have nitrite and nitrate, which are really two different oxidized products of ammonia and contain oxygen molecules that are going to be attached to nitrogen. When nitrification occurs, ammonia is going to be oxidized all the way to nitrate. And this nitrate is going can end up being denitrified all the way to nitrogen gas and released back into the atmosphere where we see nitrogen gas here. Um, we're going to investigate all the forms of these, uh, all of these forms of nitrogen throughout today's webinar and going to look a little more closely at all these forms. We can start with organic nitrogen, and it mostly comes down to three uh, forms that you're going to find in your influent. This is going to be proteins, free amino acids, and urea. Proteins are long chains of amino acids, and you can look in the top right corner. We have a long chain of amino acids uh, making up this protein structure. And so we can look at those amino acids a little bit more closely and look specifically at the amino groups within each amino acid. And you can see here in this red box um, with the individual amino acid, we have nitrogen within each amino acid. And so that's where that nitrogen is going to be bound up in these larger biological products, amino acid or proteins. Um, proteins in meat. Uh, Meat processing, cheese, or dairy plants or may make up really the most, the largest amount of nitrogen entering um, a wastewater treatment system. In comparison, when we take a look at a municipal plant, we will typically see that urea is going to be the largest contributor to nitrogen um, in a municipal plant's uh, influent. And so uh, there's a urea molecule here at the bottom, and you can see the two nitrogen molecules attached to that urea molecule. And uh, Urea can be broken down by the urease enzyme, and uh, that's going to release uh, ammonia into your system and into the nitrification pathway. So now we can take a closer look at that nitrification pathway, and the nitrification pathway is going to deal primarily with inorganic nitrogen molecules that I had mentioned earlier. We can uh, take a, a look at the first step of the nitrification pathway, and that's going to be ammonia oxidization. And so here we can see ammonia being oxidized to create nitrite, as well as some byproducts, which we'll get into a little bit later. But the important part of this first step of the nitrification process is going to be ammonia being converted um, into nitrite. And then we get to the second part of this nitrification process, and that's going to be the nitrite oxidization into nitrate and you can see that's our final product of nitrification is going to be that NO3 nitrate and uh, as you can see it's really a two-step process nitrification and it is going to go from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Uh, for plants that are not nitrifying well they really don't progress through these two sequences and the ammonia nitrogen ends up kind of just remaining and does not end up really being converted to nitrate as a final product. And uh, that's where we can see issues for plants that are not able to nitrify and go through this entire process. And we, I see a quick question in the chat room uh, about liquid eggplants. And that's also, you're gonna have a lot of protein waste from that liquid egg uh, production. And so that's where you're gonna see a lot of that nitrogen coming into your plant is going to be from those proteins um, coming into your wastewater stream. And so that's going to be something that's going to be important to look at is that you're going to have a large proportion of your nitrogen coming from those proteins that need to be broken down. We can take a step back from the nitrification process and actually look at nitrifying bacteria. And so it's important to remember that the nitrification is a biological process and it takes place with the help of these nitrifying bacteria and the enzymes that those bacteria create. 
The oxidation of ammonia to nitrite, that first step, was first thought to be primarily done through nitrosinomus and nitrospira. And we've got an image here of nitrosinomus in the top right corner. And this is a picture taken using an electron microscope. Um, you really won't be able to see these bacteria using a regular light microscope because they simply are too small. So that's uh, really what, what the best you can do in seeing an individual cell like this is going to be looking through an electron microscope. And the next step in the process is going to be primarily done through nitrobacter. And that's the process where you're oxidizing nitrite to nitrate. Uh, one interesting thing is that nitrifying bacteria are becoming um, increasingly better in wastewater activated sludge. But, um, and that's because there's it's been a lot more research in, uh, in, in recent years on nitrifying bacteria in wastewater. And one of the interesting things that's come out uh, about this research is that really, rather than having these two specific nitrifying bacteria, one taking care of nitrosinomus in the ammonia oxidization and nitrobacter in the nitrite oxidization, you're seeing that there's actually many more species of bacteria, nitrifying bacteria, that are able to um, partake in these um, two different steps. And so what's interesting is that uh, in wastewater activated sludge, rather than different nitrifying bacteria, they're, they're able to really um, specialize. And you see that you're actually going to get diversity um, with between these, uh, these nitrifying bacterial species in your specific wastewater treatment plant. And so it's not just one or the other. You're going to get really a range and diversity of species nitrifying in your specific plant based on specific conditions. So stepping back from that nitrification process, I'd now like to look a little bit more closely at um, the nitrifying bacteria that are responsible for carrying out nitrification. Um, nitrifiers are autotrophic organisms. And this means that they synthesize their energy from inorganic nutrient sources, and specifically is going to be inorganic nitrogen and inorganic carbon. Uh, this process, the oxidization of ammonia, really does not generate much energy comparatively to heterotrophic bacteria. And uh, the utilization of inorganic carbon, as you can see here in this diagram, that carbon dioxide is an example of inorganic carbon. Um, to gain cellular biomass um, within these nitrifiers is really an energy intensive process, especially compared to those heterotrophic bacteria that I mentioned. Um, we're gonna discuss that shortly and the differences between nitrifiers and heterotrophic bacteria in regard to energy um, production. Some other notes about nitrifying bacteria are that they are sensitive to environmental conditions. Um, especially changes in environmental conditions. And uh, they also inhabit varied environmental areas from the land, water, soil, the air. Um, nitrifiers are really basically everywhere in the world, but uh, what we're really gonna focus on today is nitrifiers in your wastewater treatment plant. So within a healthy wastewater treatment plant, as I said, nitrifiers are likely to inhabit flocks of bacteria throughout the mixed liquor. Through these fluorescently tagged microscopic images from a recent scientific paper on nitrification, you can see the communities of nitrifiers as well as other bacteria beginning to develop during the wastewater treatment process. On the left, you can see an example of uh, a flock at the very initial stages of a wastewater treatment plant's process. And on the right, we can see a fully developed healthy flock as well as fully developed and healthy communities of nitrifying bacteria interacting with each other. You can see ammonia oxidizing bacteria such as nitrosinomus and nitrospira in the cyan fluorescent tag. And you can see nitrite oxidizing bacteria such as nitrobacter in the pink fluorescent tag. One thing to note is that uh, nitrifiers typically are going to inhabit the outer layers of these flock um, within aeration basins. And this is largely due to oxygen availability and their own preference uh, and habitat. But um, this positioning on the outer edges of flock is also going to influence a nitrifier's ability to handle adverse environmental conditions. Uh, one last note is that U bacteria in blue would be categorized as our classic heterotrophic bacteria, and we're going to be investigating those next. Heterotrophic bacteria are going to be our other category of wastewater bacteria living within the flock, and they differ from nitrifiers in a lot of ways. Um, First off, heterotrophs are able to synth uh, synthesize food from organic sources rather than inorganic sources. And because of this, these organic carbon-based sources of food are able, to, are able to generate high amounts of energy in order to support rapid growth for heterotrophs. 
Um, heterotrophs are going to be the primary reducers of soluble BOD in wastewater systems through the breakdown of organic carbon. As you can see here in that diagram, that organic carbon is going to result in high energy production and rapid growth for your heterotrophic bacteria. So now knowing a little bit about nitrifiers and a little bit about heterotrophs, we can compare these two groups of organisms. And so it's really important to do this because understanding the distinction between these groups of organisms is going to be fundamental in understanding the differences between nitrification and typical BOD reduction in your plant. Uh, looking at this graph, we can visually see that the growth rate or number of cell divisions here uh, for heterotrophic bacteria is going to be much higher in comparison to nitrifiers. Uh, this essentially boils down to the fact that uh, these groups are using those two different food sources that I said, where nitrifiers are using low energy producing inorganic nitrogen, whereas heterotrophs are using high energy producing organic carbon for their energy source. Um, this difference is really not only going to affect growth rate, but also the recovery rate for these organisms after an offset um, due to, the, due, due to that, that doubling rate and the growth rate. So I wanted to take a quick look here and look at these two groups of organisms and actually compare them directly within a wastewater treatment system now. And wastewater systems contain a combination of both heterotrophs and nitrifiers within their bacterial population. And as I stated just before, nitrifiers are going to have a much slower growth rate utilizing nitrogen. And so we're going to see that their doubling rate for a nitrifier population is going to be around 22 to 48 hours. In comparison, we can take a look at heterotrophs, and heterotrophs are going to have a doubling rate of around 20 to 30 minutes. So quite the difference there in growth rate and the amount of heterotrophs and nitrifiers that we're going to see. So that doubling rate is going to not only lead to a faster growth rate, as I said, but also it leads to a higher overall proportional population taking up over 90% of total bacteria cells within a wastewater system for heterotrophs. And we can compare that to nitrifiers where we see that nitrifier populations are going to take up around four to six percent on average of the total bacterial population within your wastewater treatment facility. So that really is quite the difference. And it's important to, to, to really take that home because relatively low levels of nitrifiers making up your population of wastewater bacteria is going to be important when thinking about not only susceptibility, but also recovery from upsets within your system. Before moving on, I just wanted to really briefly cover Aquafix's uh, really um, primary nitrification and ammonia removal product um, as it really directly relates to our current conversation on not only nitrifiers but also heterotrophic bacteria. Um, the Vitastim Dynamic Duo product is what we use to reseed nitrifying bacteria within a wastewater plant. Um, and either to, in order to help to either recover um, nitrification or boost the current nitrification and am ammonia removal rates. Um, we produce laboratory cultures of nitrifying bacteria, and when we're producing these cultures, we prioritize diversity and adaptability to different environmental conditions for our nitrifiers. And uh, these nitrifiers are specifically produced through a batch culture process and are included with environmental cofactors and micronutrients to support population growth and establishment within any particular wastewater treatment system that they are applied to. Uh, the Dynamic Duo is a two-part product, and the first part that I want to briefly talk about is Vitastim nitrifiers. Uh, Vitastim nitrifiers, um, as the name uh, permits, is going to be made up of our autotrophic nitrifiers, and they're going to follow that nitrification pathway for energy, taking ammonia, oxidizing it to nitrite, and then oxidizing it to a final product, a nitrate. Um, the second part of the product is going to be our Vitastim ammonia assimilators. And these are going to consist of uh, heterotrophic ammonia assimilators. And so these are bacteria that can take up nitrogen from organic sources and either incorporate it directly into their cellular structure or uh, have it be released into the nitrification cycle. And it's just using ammonia assimilators is just another way of lowering the ammonia in a treatment plant, and it also works at very low levels of DO, which is pretty handy for some systems that struggle with maintaining sufficient oxygen levels. 
Although this is a secondary process for ammonia removal and the nitrification process is definitely primary, um, together it's just two different ways of getting ammonia and nitrogen levels brought down within your plant for the best results. So talking about nitrifying bacteria, talking about nitrification, and talking about that product, I want to now just show what that looks like visually on this graph when we're comparing levels of not only ammonia, but nitrite and nitrate. Um, and so I want to show that process of ammonia uptake and removal, and this was done within our lab in a controlled culture. And so this graph shows a recent run of this, and this was using a dose of a Vitus, of our Vitastem Dynamic Duo product in 100 milliliters of nitrifier media and 50 parts per million of ammonia in these flasks with our nitrifiers. Uh, one thing to note is that this occurred after our nitrifiers were stored in our fridge in our lab for six months um, of storage time and then used in this testing. Um, so. I want to take a look at what this testing looks like um, on this graph and what this process looks like. And so we can see we start with around 50 parts per million of ammonia, and that ammonia is immediately starting to, to decrease as those ammonia oxidizing bacteria are able to remove ammonia and convert it into nitrite. You can see nitrite here in the orange, and as ammonia starts to be reduced, nitrite levels start to increase in our flasks during this test period. We can see then as nitrite ends up slowly starting to be reduced, what we see is our nitrate line in green start to increase as levels of nitrate, that final product of nitrification, starts to increase as our nitrification reaction is completed. We can see at the end that we have around a little bit more than 50 parts per million of nitrate in our flasks and we have no ammonia left in the flask, as well as no nitrite, as we got full removal using our nitrifiers. And so this is that relationship that we're talking about between these three uh, nitrogen-based molecules during the nitrification process by these nitrifying bacteria. And uh, one thing I want to note is that you can see that this removal of nitrite appears to be slightly slower in the orange in comparison to the removal of ammonia in the red that almost looks like a linear drop in ammonia levels. And so we're going to investigate this further, but that's going to be kind of where we start to see these issues with a slower reaction uh, time for nitrite being oxidized into nitrate. And so that previous slide was showing ammonia removal within a controlled environment in our laboratory. But unfortunately to us and to all of you, nitrifiers in the environment are gonna be a little bit more difficult to deal with. Uh, first, nitrifiers, as I said, are almost present everywhere in the environment from the soil, air, and water. And however, unfortunately, nitrifiers are also very sensitive to environmental changes. Um, around them. And this is where it becomes really difficult to maintain a healthy and efficient population of nitrifiers within a wastewater treatment system. This rings especially true if system or influent changes are occurring within your particular plant. Uh, finally, there's going to be a really stark difference when we're talking about environmental changes in regard to chronic and acute issues. Um, acute issues provide hope for recovery after conditions are able to return to normal and into an optimal range for our nitrifiers. But chronic issues with in regard to environmental conditions can make it exceedingly difficult to maintain nitrification as these nitrifiers are a little bit picky and do prefer certain environmental conditions. So the first environmental condition I would like to talk about today is about uh, retention time within a wastewater system or your sludge age within your wastewater system. This is really just to get a perspective of what may be, may be going on within your activated sludge system and how that can end up relating to your ability to nitrify. So first off, it's really important to remember that you need to have healthy flock formers and sufficient and good BOD removal before nitrification can even begin to occur. Um, healthy flocks is going to mean that your sludge age is really not too young or too old, but kind of we're hitting that healthy middle ground that's right for your particular plant. Um, unfortunately, nitrification really doesn't work too well at either side of the spectrum at a young sludge age or an old sludge age. And that's due because if your sludge age is too young, you're going to have more BOD coming into your system than you can remove in a good time frame 
with your heterotrophic bacteria. And this means that really the nitrifiers are not going to be able to get enough oxygen as these flock formers and heterotrophs are going to be using up as much oxygen as they can as they start to break down that initial BOD before nitrification can occur. Um, it's important to remember that uh, nitrifiers need oxygen for nitrification. So if that oxygen is gone due to high levels of BOD and respiration, then that is going to affect your ability to nitrify. If your sludge age is too old on the other side of the spectrum, you may see poor BOD removal, or you may end up seeing the disintegration and breaking up of your flock as bacteria inside of it die. And this can also be uh, an issue for nitrifying bacteria as if there's not this healthy, proper flock formation and sufficient BOD reduction, we're not gonna be able to get much for nitrification. Here's just a quick visual representation of flock formation as it can relate to sludge age from a young sludge age to an older sludge age. And we really wanna see flock that are gonna be similar to the image on the far right. Uh, somewhat condensed, irregular in shape, and healthy. And this happens at the really going to be the correct sludge age or retention time for your particular wastewater system. And this is where nitrification can be optimized within your particular system. And as I said earlier, next, another somewhat of an environmental condition, but an environmental factor on uh, nitrification is going to be nitrite lock within um, occurring within your specific uh, treatment facility. And uh, as I stated before, the oxidization of nitrite to nitrate, that second step in nitrification, is going to be the slower and rate limiting step of the reaction as a whole compared to ammonia being converted into nitrite. And so because of this discrepancy, nitrate oxidizing bacteria are really often not able to keep up with ammonia oxidizing bacteria. And this causes a buildup of nitrite within the system. And you can see that on this graph on the right here, we have that box around that kind of that plateau of buildup of nitrite, where that nitrite right there is just not able to keep up with the rate at which ammonia is being removed uh, in comparison. And that leads to that buildup. Um, a buildup of nitrite can temporarily limit ammonia oxidization from occurring and can lead to elevated effluent nitrite and ammonia levels leaving the system. And uh, this can often occur in systems with large inputs or dumps of ammonia, where that ammonia can be rapidly uh, oxidized down to nitrite. And that nitrite process then takes a little bit longer and can build up and end up locking up um, nitrification as a whole. Moving on, I would like to talk a little bit about temperature and how temperatures in the environment can affect nitrification. Uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you are dealing with some cold weather and uh, cold temperatures in your uh, treatment facilities right now. And I know that a lot of you may have uh, had effects on your nitrifier's ability to nitrify under these colder temperatures. Specifically, I want to say that rapid temperature shifts can really have significant adverse effects on nitrification. And this is largely due to the fact that nitrifiers are really unable to adjust quickly due to their slow growth rates. And uh, most bacteria in municipal wastewater, including nitrifiers, are gonna have a slower metabolism and slower growth rates as temperature does decrease. Specifically for nitrifiers, uh, we're gonna see that they prefer a temperature range between 15 to 30 degrees Celsius. That's gonna be around 59 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And nitrifiers are gonna have trouble growing fast enough to really maintain a sufficient population below that 15 degrees Celsius uh, level. And sometimes nitrifiers are actually gonna have problems with uh, low levels of dissolved oxygen um, within water at temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius as oxygen solubility uh, decreases at these higher temperatures. In the graph on the right, we uh, did some in-house in testing on how temperature can affect nitrifiers and nitrification. And uh, you can see that um, we had temperatures that were placed in two different temperature, or nitrifiers that were placed in two different temperature chambers at seven degrees Celsius and 23 degrees Celsius. And we just wanted to see how the rate of nitrification was affected at these two different temperatures. As you can see from the graph that uh, the temperatures that were placed in the colder seven degrees Celsius chamber had a harder time to nitrify and had a slower nitrification rate. And this is something that we commonly see um, everywhere with the colder weather um, slowing down the nitrification process. Um, some populations of nitrifiers may be able to uh, adjust to a consistent temperature outside of this range. Um, 
as long as as long as it's consistent. However, prolonged cold or rapid fluctuations of temperature really can be detrimental to a nitrifier population as a whole. So we can move on from temperature, and I would now like to discuss dissolved oxygen as it relates to uh, nitrification. Um, Nitrifiers perform optimally within a wastewater treatment system that has dissolved oxygen levels around two to four parts per million. Uh, the, this range of DO provides sufficient levels of oxygen for not only BOD removal and reduction to occur, but also nitrification and ammonia removal. The top right picture is an example of what really good DO looks like within wastewater flocks. Um, we look at these flocks within our laboratories under phase contrast using the 40x objective in order just to get a sense what dissolved oxygen levels look like uh, penetrating these flocks. Um, and then the picture on the bottom just below is going to be an example of what low levels of dissolved oxygen in flocks look like. And uh, it's important to, rem and you can tell this actually by, if you can see the darker colors under phase contrast and the black appearance of these flocks, that's going to be a sign of low levels of dissolved, dissolved oxygen. Um, it's important to remember here that nitrifiers need oxygen to perform nitrification. And uh, really low levels of dissolved oxygen in your system can end up leading to more anaerobic bacterial metabolism, which isn't going to use as much nitrogen or phosphorus per, per carbon substrate as aerobic metabolism that we're talking about. So uh, you can end up getting ammonia released back into the water and not utilized by bacteria uh, under these low levels of dissolved oxygen. One other note is that BOD slug loads could, and also uh, coming into a plant can also really quickly drop levels of dissolved oxygen and thus limit nitrification from occurring until sufficient DO is going to be established again. And uh, our nitrifiers we produce in house are going to be acclimated to DO conditions similar to most wastewater treatment plants. And uh, this makes the application and, and establishment process a, a pretty easy. Now uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about pH and uh, talk about how uh, a, a treatment plant's pH can affect nitrifiers. And uh, so nitrifying bacteria are generally going to be working best in a pH range of around 6.2 to 7.9. And the closer they are around to a pH of 7.2, the happier and more efficient your uh, nitrifier population is going to be. Um, the ammonia oxidation process produces nitrike, uh, nitric acid as a byproduct. And so this acid production is going to end up dropping the pH within a, a, a water body or a, a treatment plant. Um, and a pH drop and uh, lowering a pH to around 5.5 can actually end up inhibiting further ammonia oxidization as it's outside that optimal range. Uh, conversely, on the other side of the pH spectrum, ammonia oxidizing bacteria will either be dormant or may die at pHs of greater than 8.5. And uh, one thing to note about uh, pHs greater than 8.5 is that you end up getting a conversion of ammonium, NH4+, to ammonia, NH3, as you can see on this figure on the right. And at high levels, either one of these compounds uh, can actually be toxic to nitrifying bacteria, interestingly. But um, ammonia, NH3, is actually going to be uh, have a higher toxic uh, toxicity in comparison. So that's where these higher uh, pH values leading to this higher proportion of NH3 can actually be harmful to nitrifying bacteria. And so because of that, that optimal pH range is really going to be best for nitrifying bacteria. Um, this isn't meant to scare you or worry you. But uh, pH fluctuations are going to be pretty unlikely to occur in most systems. And this is going to be especially true in systems with sufficient levels of alkalinity. We can define alkalinity as the buffering capacity of a water body and um, is really going to be essential to control not only the pH level within that optimal range of nitrification. Um, alkalinity, uh, carbonates and hydroxides are the major contributors to a system's alkalinity level as a whole. And uh, interestingly enough, nitrifiers primarily use inorganic carbon, as I stated before, and they're primarily going to be using these carbonates, carbon dioxide, and bicarbonates as their primary inorganic carbon source for uh, cellular components and eventual conversion into organic carbon. 
Um, these compounds that make up alkalinity also help sustain that consistent pH value, as I said, within a plant. So making it all the more important to maintain sufficient alkalinity within your plant, especially when nitrification is uh, creating this acid as a byproduct. Uh, typically, alkalinity around 100 parts per million is optimal for nitrifier function. However, this value is going to be flexible for your specific treatment system. So for plants that actually are struggling, though, with low alkalinity levels or pH swings due to that, uh, Aquafix does have a product called a Boost and Lock, and this can offer a solution for you and your nitrifier population that's dealing with these pH swings. Uh, Boost and Lock is going to be a combination of carbonates, hydroxides, uh, and these can sufficiently increase alkalinity levels within a plant. And a boost and lock is not only able to effectively neutralize the production of nitric acid during nitrification, but it also is able to act as an inorganic carbon source for these nitrifiers as well. Um, and so the combination of ingredients in boost and lock can really provide a, like superior stabilization um, in comparison to the addition of um, these alkaline ingredients on their own. And so I wanted to, to really end our environmental parameters with talking about toxicity. Uh, toxicity may be the most important environmental parameter because exposure to toxicity uh, for nitrifiers can really be lethal. And uh, I want to start off by talking about how toxic compounds in a treatment system's influent can really then adversely affect a uh, native nitrifier population. Um, upstream sources, uh, these are often industrial sources, can be common sources for toxicity coming into a wastewater treatment system. Um, nitrifiers are often more sus susceptible to toxins in comparison to other wastewater heterotrophic bacteria. This is largely going to be due to their thin cell wall and their slow rate of regrowth after being exposed to a toxin compound. Um, this really is going to make recovery after toxic exposure all the more difficult for your plant and your nitrifiers. Um, these biocide cleaners and sanitation compounds, they can remain present within the influent uh, from coming upstream and can enter into your plant and expose and exposure of these compounds to nitrifying bacteria can limit nitrification as well uh, as well as kill off your nitrifying population. Aquafix has done extensive research on toxicity's impact on nitrification, and their research has primarily revolved around quats or quaternary ammonium compounds. I just want to take a quick break here. I know that was a lot of information, but I want to go over some of the takeaways we had in this first part of um, in this first part of basically uh, the presentation. So what I want to say here is that it's important to remember that nitrifying and heterotrophic bacteria are going to be different. Um, we're saying that in the sense that uh, not only is their energy substrate different, their growth rate's going to be different, and their ability to handle environmental conditions is going to be different. So you really need to not treat the plant as one entire, one, one um, uniform group of bacteria, but rather you have these different uh, populations of bacteria um, doing different uh, process or conducting different uh, pr treatment processes within your plant. And with that, we want to remember that nitrifiers do have this delicate relationship with the environment, and they really uh, are, are able to efficiently uh, nitrify under these optimal environmental conditions. And finally, I want to just mention briefly that uh, the repopulation of nitrifiers is difficult due to these many factors, and uh, we're going to be investigating that uh, point a little bit further with some data later in this presentation. And so again, I wanted to take a quick break here. I know that was a lot of information on nitrifying bacteria as a whole, but uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to write them in the chat box, and I can either answer some now as time permits, or I can also follow up with a longer response after the webinar has concluded. Um, in, in regard here to this one question from Evan about what level of parasitic acid would you consider to be toxic? Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of factors that go into specific toxicity and how it's going to affect the population. This is going to be not only um, taking into account the level of nitrifiers you have, the health of nitrifiers you have, and the amount of solids in your plant that's able to absorb that toxin as well. So there, there, there's a lot of, and, and the amount of toxin that's left by the time it gets to your plant. 
So there really is going to be a lot of uh, factors that go into that. And so I, I wouldn't be able to offer a specific number right now, but um, that's something that I think we, we could look into if we uh, um, could e have an email and uh, do some more of that uh, do, and look into that your specific case more. And then this question from Taylor that was just asked, what is a good uh, milligram per liter concentration of um, mixed liquor suspended solids? We are around 3,500 to 3,800. Um, Taylor, that's going to be uh, really um, a, a another question where there's not a, a perfect amount. Uh, typically, I think we, we shoot for the typical municipal plant for a, a lower than 3,500 to 3,800. But this is also going to depend a lot about on what kind of waste you're treating and what the health and, and, and appearance of your bacteria, bacterial population is underneath the microscope. So in, in, in some ways, the, the 3,500 to 3,800 may be a perfect uh, uh, concentration of mixed liquor for your waste stream. But uh, typically, I think we see that lower than that should be um, Lower, lower than that number is, is typically what we're seeing for uh, healthy mixed liquor suspended solids. Um, and this question from Doug, uh, is uh, in a startup situation when pH is boosted due to aeration, does pH need to be adjusted downward in order for nitrification to begin or will that happen by itself? Uh, in most startup situations, um, pH, if, if you have a startup and the pH is stuck um, at a very high, uh, at a high level that's inhibiting nitrification after like multiple days, that's something where you would want to then adjust that pH back down into that optimal range uh, for nitrification to occur. A lot of times in a startup situation, that pH can naturally come down as, nitrific as nitrifiers are able to start nitrifying and producing that nitric acid and coming back down to that optimal range. So that is something that uh, would be more of a situation, uh, like situation by situation basis. But um, typically, it, you, it should be fine to come down. But if it's not coming down, that's something where we, we, we can adjust it and uh, have that happen. If we can move on now, um, what I want to do with the second half of this presentation is really just show some of the research, some of the data that he, we, uh, that us here at Aquafix have done on nitrification, on nitrifying bacteria, as well as um, some toxicities impact on nitrifiers, and uh, we're also going to look at how uh, our you know, our, our primary nitrifier product here at Aquafix Vitus and Dynamic Duo can help assist in the recovery of nitrification after a toxin upset. Um, the primary toxin we analyzed, as I said before, was quat here at Aquafix, but um, this should be, can, can be used as a, a general toxin and how, in general, how nitrifiers are going to respond to that. I want to start off here with some of our data. We wanted to show you all a baseline for how quat and how other toxins can not only affect BOD removal within a wastewater plant, but also ammonia removal within a wastewater plant. We had flask that you saw in the image, uh, in the previous image. I can go back to that real quickly. We had these wastewater reactor flasks uh, set up with mixed liquor, and we um, ended up spiking uh, mixed liquor with, uh, with, with quat at different concentrations to see how that affected um, the level of BOD removal as well as the level of ammonia removal. We can see here at 10 parts per million at quat within our systems, we really don't start to see any adverse effects in regard to BOD or ammonia reduction. However, as you can see with the increase in concentration of quat, we now start to see that ammonia removal becomes adversely affected uh, with the presence of quat. And this is a comparison to BOD removal where it really remains unchanged, the ability for your heterotrophs to remove BOD in this higher concentration of quat. And uh, we see that this trend kind of continues where BOD removal is not nearly as affected as uh, nit nitrogen removal by your nitrifiers under the presence of increased concentrations of toxin, or in this case, quat. Um, and so it's it's really important because this shows that nitrifying bacteria are going to be more in, more sensitive to the presence of toxins. And this is also one of the primary reasons why nitrification is going to be a more fragile process in general in comparison to the removal of BOD within your wastewater treatment plants. 
And so I wanted to move on, and now I wanted to say, well, we can see what happens when toxin, it, toxins are exposed to these wastewater reactor flasks, but now let's take a look at um, how recovery is um, from after the exposure to toxins. And so these this test was run um, with, um, I want to first look, and these were, this test was run in those reactors that we showed before. And I want to first point out the uh, the the blue lines here. These are a control flasks without any toxin exposure, and you can see that we have really consistent removal of not only BOD or COD as well as removal of ammonia throughout the entire experiment uh, within our control flasks. Um, in this case, in this experiment, we did a 50 part per million toxin event containing quat in order to affect not only the nitrifiers, but also the heterotrophic bacteria in order to see the recovery difference between the both. Um, after toxin exposure on day zero, we can now see effluent COD levels rising to around 165 parts per million from 40 parts per million at that baseline. And we can see ammonia levels rising to around 20 parts per million from zero before. So now I want to take a look at the recovery time differences between COD and ammonia removal after this toxin exposure. We can see here that it really took only about three days for to swiftly recover COD removal within our wastewater reactor flask. Whereas when we compare that to ammonia uh, removal recovery, we can see that it took around seven days for ammonia to be fully, uh, ammonia removal to fully recover within our wastewater flask. Um, and our ammonia feed was pretty low within this initial experiment. And so this is why I believe it really didn't take even longer for ammonia removal to recover in this experiment. <laughs> Um, and so the takeaway I want you all to have from this graph should be as follows. Um, really, ammonia removal recovery is going to take longer than BOD, than BOD removal recovery after a toxin event. And also, it's going to be more difficult than uh, being able to recover BOD removal. And so now here, uh, we can take a look at some of our data in regard to how our product uh, at Aquafix, Vitasim Dynamic Duo, can actually help accelerate and aid the natural recovery of nitrification after a toxic upset. Again, we have wastewater uh, reactor flasks that were running for three days with consistent ammonia reduction. And on day three of this test, we ended up spiking um, the wastewater reactor flask with uh, quat. And this toxin, as you can see, uh, killed and damaged the nitrifier population as we see um, ammonia levels in these flasks spike up to above six parts per million. Well, we can see now at day five, as you look there, that Vitasim Dynamic Duo was added to half of the reactors as a one-time dose application in order to aid in the recovery of ammonia removal. And so we can see that after the application of Dynamic Duo, um, we can see that ammonia ends up recovering pretty rapidly in our wastewater reactor flasks. And this is in comparison to our, uh, our control flasks that did not have any um, Dynamic Duo product added to them in the red here. So this just shows a, a visual example and a, and a data-driven example of the potential benefits of utilizing Vitus and Dynamic Duo to help really accelerate that ammonia removal recovery process within your wastewater system after some sort of upset. In this case, it was toxicity, but this upset that would uh, end up triggering um, a reduced amount of ammonia removal can be anything from any of those environmental parameters that I had mentioned earlier. So our nitrifying bacteria can help rem restore that nitrification after an acute upset that we saw in that previous experiment. But it's still important to remember that chronic environmental issues can still permanently inhibit nitrification from efficiently occurring. Um, as we can see here, we have those, all those environmental issues that we ended up uh, discussing earlier briefly and keeping those environmental conditions within that relative range for efficient nitrification is really going to be just as important for aiding uh, in the recovery of, of, of in the recovery of nitrification after an upset as it would be for reseeding nitrifying bacteria into your um, plant to help support the growth of your nitrifier population. So I wanted to circle back real quickly um, and just show our uh, our Vitasim Dynamic Duo nitrification product again after uh, showing some of that in-house lab data using our uh, Vitasim Dynamic Duo product. 
Our product is based on this laboratory produced culture of nitrifying bacteria here, as well as those environmental cofactors and micronutrients that help establish growth within uh, your treatment system. Um, our product should help uh, recover nitrification as well as establish a better ability to organically assimilate uh, nitrogen within your treatment system. I just wanted to then mention as well that our products are typically added at the same time to use simultaneously within your system. And regarding location for that, uh, our Dynamic Duo product is typically going to be added directly to the aeration basin in order to get a quick drop in ammonia and reseed your native nitrifier population and establish growth there. After uh, 10 days, we typically have strong results in regard to ammonia removal. Um, and recovering nitrifier populations to have sustainable growth moving forward. Within those 10 days, we typically begin to see results starting to occur after about three days in municipal facilities and about seven days in industrial uh, facilities. Finally, our dynamic duo product cultures are going to be well adapted to varied environmental conditions um, in order to allow for adaptability and uh, some hardiness to occur when being applied into uh, different wastewater treatment facilities as Nothing really is ever the same, so we want to make sure that our nitrifiers can um, adapt reasonably well to your specific wastewater treatment facility. So I would like to end today's presentation with just highlighting some recent case studies from the field um, of using our Vitasim Dynamic Duo product in order to help solve nitrification issues from both municipal and industrial facilities. Um, I just want to show some of these cases to say this is what we, we have experienced in the field in some uh, real world examples on uh, recovering nitrif nitrification within a specific wastewater treatment facility. So first I'd like to start in a municipal plant in Pennsylvania. Um, this particular plant unfortunately had a large diesel fuel spill and it was about seven 55 gallon drums worth of diesel fuel uh, spilling upstream from their treatment process. Um, this was this the, the spill was pretty detrimental for the nitrifier population to say the least. Um, typically, this plant had about 220 parts per million BOD and 23 to 32 parts per million ammonia coming into the plant. So it really was pretty typical for a municipal plant. Um, one thing to note is that temperature was somewhat cold at 13 degrees Celsius when this event occurred and during the recovery period. So. After this, uh, this is diesel fuel spill, uh, BOD removal was actually able to be recovered pretty quickly. And uh, that was encouraging to see, but unfortunately nitrification remained limited as effluent ammonia continued to increase for multiple months after the spill. Um, and so with these temperatures remaining low, recovery appeared difficult as it just seemed like the nitrifier population in this plant was just not working as efficiently as possible to completely remove ammonia from the plant. So our solution for this municipal plant was uh, to begin feeding Dynamic Duo at uh, one gallon per SBR at their plant starting in the first week of January. And so we still had that 13 degrees Celsius average temperature um, during that first week of January uh, when treatment was started. And so uh, it was really encouraging though because even in those cold temperatures, efficient ammonia removal was able to still be recovered after one week of treatment. And our effluent ammonia levels in this plant ended up returning to normal at less than one part per million. So this was a nice uh, little case study seeing that we were able to still be successful even at a, in restoring um, efficient and complete nitrification, even at a lower temperature. I wanna move on now and kind of show an industrial example of nitrification recovery that we uh, worked on recently. And here at Aquafix, we worked with a barge cleaning facility. Uh, the, and um, this barge cleaning facility had two batch reactors within their system. Typically, they had 250 parts per million ammonia coming into the first reactor. And eventually, they had one part per million ammonia leaving that second and final reactor. And uh, this barge cleaning facility suspected a toxic event had occurred. Um, and effluent ammonia levels ended up rising to around 25 parts per million. Um, and so after that effluent ammonia levels rose to 25 parts per million, we ended up proposing the solution of Dynamic Duo and we started a 10 day treatment of Dynamic Duo down at this barge cleaning facility. Uh, Dynamic Duo was applied at three and a half ounces of nitrifiers to the first reactor daily. 
And after 10 days, we were incredibly happy to see that ethylene ammonia levels had recovered to around 1 ppm from that 25 uh, ppm upset level. And uh, we were happy to see that moving forward, this uh, a healthier nitro fire population was reestablished in this particular treatment system after this toxic shock. All right, and then we have one more case study for all of you that I just wanted to go over quickly. This is a really interesting case study because it's dealing less with just the oxidation of ammonia, but looking at what happened when we saw nitrite lock occurring in a meat processing facility. Um, and so this hog slaughter facility had an activated sludge process that included a 1.8 million gallon aeration tank. Um, their waste stream really heavily favored ammonia in comparison to BOD, as uh, influent ammonia levels were actually around 200 parts per million in comparison to influent BOD levels, which were around 30 to 40 parts per million. Effluent ammonia was efficiently being, or ammonia was efficiently being removed typically, as effluent ammonia was usually around less than one part per million. One part to note about this plant is that the alkalinity was 120 part per million typical, but it can get as low as 50 parts per million and pH swings were possible in this plant. So we come to our problem and the issue began when heavier loading led to a rapid pH drop to six within the plant, as well as a pump malfunction led to a loss of significant solids from the aeration tank. So not only do we have pH swings, but we also have a loss of solids and a loss of some of your nitrifier population. Both of these issues led to ammonia spiking to around 5.6 parts per million initially. And uh, this plant, interestingly, was able to pause treatment and uh, had, a, had, a, had a recovery of their ammonia uh, or nitrifier population and effluent ammonia levels were able to return back to normal um, after they were able to pause and uh, pause their treatment and continue on. However, what's interesting is even with ammonia levels going back to around zero, the operator noticed that nitrite effluent levels continued to increase up to around 45 parts per million after this initial offset. And thus, this complete nitrification process was still not occurring in this plant, even though ammonia was being oxidized. And so this is where we really end up, ended up suspecting nitrite lock occurring within this plant, where your ammonia is being able to still be oxidized, but your nitrite oxidizing bacteria are not able to efficiently oxidize your nitrite into nitrate and complete that nitrification process. Our solution for this plant was... Uh, that in order to fix the nitrite lock issue was to reestablish the nitrite oxidizing uh, population of nitrifiers. And so we could do that through the application of Dynamic Duo as we both are containing ammonia oxidizing nitrifiers within Dynamic Duo, as well as nitrite oxidizing nitrifiers. Um, after a two gallon initial dose, nitrite levels were able to be rapidly reduced to 7.7 .7 parts per million. Um, unfortunately, we weren't in a lab and everything wasn't controlled and there was a cool temperature shift that did occur at this plant after that initial dose. And with that rapid shift in temperature, we saw nitrite levels actually increase rapidly back to around 32 parts per million. Uh, this is unfortunate, but we continued treatment as temperature uh, was able to remain consistent and we ended up getting a full recovery and nitrite lock issues were ended up being able to be solved with the application of Dynamic Duo and the reestablishment of nitrite oxidizing organisms and full complete nitrification in this meat processing plant. And uh, with those, I would like to just then kind of wrap up with some more takeaways um, I see some uh, uh, Don asking a question about plant flow at the time of treatment real quick in the chat. Um, I don't have the exact number off me, but um, in the paper uh, that we are giving out, these case studies are going to be highlighted in that ni uh, nitrification paper in the handouts, and the flow would be able to be found in there. Um, I, can, I can get that for you as well and email it to you. But um, moving on from those case studies, I hope that can show just a nice little example of, of in the field what we've been able to do uh, with recovering and helping assist in recovering nitrification for these plants. 
And so I want to just then go back and then let's remember some of what we've been talking about. And that's that nitrification recovery after an upset is difficult and it can take an extended period of time. Uh, BOD, BOD removal recovery is going to be an easier process and a hardier process. And that's why we're focusing on nitrification recovery today. We see in some of our case studies and some of our, our, our in-house lab testing that Vitastim Dynamic Duo can help enhance that nitrification recovery through the reestablishment of your nitrifier population and rapid removal from, of ammonia. And finally, we, we really have all this information from some extensive laboratory and field data. And as I said in that handout in that, our recent nitrifier paper from last year, that's gonna have a lot of that data and that uh, from both the lab and the field in it um, on, on where we're, we're really getting our information for nitrifier uh, solutions. And so with that, I would like to thank all of you so much for joining us today. I know we ran a little long, but I hope you were able to learn a little bit more about nitrification and wastewater, as well as a little bit more about our solutions for recovering nitrification after it's been lost or upset. Uh, one note is that all of our past webinars can be seen at the following link on the Team Aquafix website. And again, I really appreciate everyone being here today and uh, going through and, and listening to this information on nitrification. I hope that we can act as a partner and, a, and assist in any of your nitrification issues or questions moving forward. And uh, with that, I would like to offer it up to any more questions to be posted in the chat room. But again, one more time, I just would like to say thank you for attending. Um, I really appreciate your time, and I'll answer some questions now. So Larry's asking, what do we offer to help with bio peer removal? Well, we offer um, a, an assortment of products for uh, biological phosphorus removal and helping with assisting with that uh, phosphorus removal. Um, we help out with the, the, the breakdown of more complex proteins that contain a lot of those phosphorus compounds. Um, and we have a biocatalyst product, uh, Quicksign P, for that. And we also have some other products that um, can be used to help out with biological phosphorus removal. Um, and you guys can uh, we reach out and help out with that and get you some of those either product sheets or some more information on what we can help with with biological phosphorus removal. But we do have um, products for that. So is Vitastim needing a maintenance dose over time is a question from Jeff. And with this question, Jeff, that's a really good question. For some of our studies, we did just do a one-time dose to, to monitor what's going to go on and to make sure that those nitrifiers that we are applying to our reactor flask in the lab are actually growing rather than just nitrifying for a day and then stopping. So that's kind of was, was our thinking in our, in our research to do that one-time dose. However, typically within a uh, wastewater treatment uh, facility in the field, we're going to have a maintenance dose through that 10-day treatment period. And after that, our goal is to really have nitrification restored and then to not have to continue to, to um, be applying more and more nitrifiers into your system, as there should be this natural and sustainable population there that's still growing within the system and then removing ammonia. So the maintenance notes over time should not be necessary as we really hope to have all those um, nitrification issues solved within that 10 day treatment period. And then your plant can take over and your nitrifiers can take over in a healthier manner and remove nitrogen. So can this be applied from Sean to an an our anaerobic digester before it goes to the aeration pond? So the one issue with that is the, um, for the ammonia assimilator, sure we could, uh, have that working in an anaerobic digester possibly. But the issue with applying nitrifiers to an anaerobic digester is as I stated, the nitrifiers really need oxygen and that aerobic um, aerobic environment in order to oxidize ammonia to nitrite and to nitrate. And so that's gonna be the importance with uh, with having an oxygen source for those nitrifying bacteria when trying to um, actually be able to remove ammonia. But thank you for that question. So for this question from Don about what type of dose was required to deal with quat toxicity to return to normal, um, we saw that our, our really, it, 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 one, the, the dose rate can depend on one of many things. It can depend on, um, and we can see that I think, believe they're on the product sheet, our dose rates. 
but it can depend on the temperature as you may need a larger dose rate if you have a colder environment that you're going to be applying these nitrifiers into. And that's gonna be important because the nitrifiers at that colder temperature are not gonna be able to be as efficient in removing ammonia. So you're gonna need a higher dose rate. Um, in regard to recovering with dealing with quat toxicity, that dose rate is going to be pretty standard as a uh, quat toxicity as hopefully is not going to be remaining in the system for a very extended period of time. So um, just our, our, our standard dose rate should be efficient uh, in most cases to be able to recover from normal from quat or any other type of toxicity coming in in an event. Um, as I said, that would be an acute event rather than consistent levels of quat coming into your influent and disrupting your nitrifier population. I just wanted to say again, hopefully I was able to provide some uh, useful information on nitrification to all of you. And I really hope that um, that I was able to, to, to give you some more information and be able to be, act as a partner in uh, this fight to have efficient and uh, complete nitrification in all of your plants. Um, but with that, I just want to say thank you again so much for joining me today. And I look forward to working uh, to really help on any nitrification issues in the future. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.